So a 50-year-old male is brought in by his wife due to confusion and the patient complains of chest pain. Vital, vital signs show a blood pressure of 100 over 70. Exam shows distension of the jugular vein and heart sounds are difficult to appreciate on exam. EKG shows QRS complexes of varying amplitudes and a procedure in what area would relieve this patient's condition. So A is in between parietal and fibrous pericardium, B is in between epicardium and parietal pericardium, C is in between epicardium and myocardium, and then D is in between myocardium and endocardium. So take this time to answer it and then I'll explain. Okay, so the answer is going to be B, in between the epicardium and the parietal pericardium. So let's go through this and recap what this is first of all. So this is called cardiac tamponade. And so cardiac tamponade is when you have fluid in between the epicardium and the parietal pericardium. So in between there, and so for example, you have this crude sketch of a heart, and so you have this epicardium, and then you also have the parietal pericardium. And so in between, there's going to be a little bit of fluid there to help lubricate the heart whenever it's beating and contracting. Now, the problem is for a variety of different reasons, it can be idiopathic, meaning we don't know why, or it can be viral, a virus can cause inflammation and cause an increased amount of fluid in this area. So regardless of the reason, a rapid increase of fluid in this area would suddenly cause a lot of pressure on the, on the heart. And so this is a problem is the heart needs to beat, right? And so if suddenly there's a huge force crushing it, now suddenly the left side, of, remember that this is the patient's left side, the left side of the heart gets crushed, it can't send out blood. And so it's going to get blocked up all the way into the right side of the heart. And so that leads us into the signs that we see in this patient on physical exam. And so for, this is called Beck's triad. And so this is going to be a triad that you'll see in these types of practice questions. So it's going to be JVD, which stands for jugular venous distension. And just like the name implies, the internal jugular vein is going to be distended uh, beyond its normal capacity. So normally, uh, the units are between six and eight. And so typically, the way you measure jugular venous pressure is you raise the patient, uh, patient's bed, um, the part of their head up around 30 to 45 degrees. And then you measure their jugular vein and you'll see a sort of like a snake tongue, uh, a flicking in their jugular vein. And that's how you know it's the vein and not the artery. And so you measure that with the sternal angle and then you add five to get to the right atrium. And so all this combined, the normal should be six to eight. So let's say it's 10 in this example, right? So then you would know it's jugular venous distension. And so the second thing is, and and this is this jugular venous distension is because this jugular vein is directly connected uh, to the inferior vena cava, which drains into the right atrium. So like I was saying, if you have a huge amount of fluid right here, that's impeding the left ventricle from contracting, then that fluid is going to back up into the right heart uh, just because, for example, when you have a traffic jam, the, the blockage is behind the traffic jam. So same way, if the left heart is blocked, then it's going to block, it's going to block the blood flow and then the right heart's going to fill up and then that's going to regurgitate, regurgitate into the jugular vein. And so that's how we get the first part of Beck's triad. The second part is hypotension. So we saw that here, 100 over 70, that the patient has hypotension. So once again, because we have this blockage, uh, this fluid is uh, pushing and exerting a lot of pressure on the left ventricle, we can't get enough blood out. And so that's going to have less blood going into the periphery, and that's going to cause hypotension. And the final part is they might not say muffled heart sounds, which is kind of a buzzword. They might just say, describe it a little bit differently and say heart sounds are difficult to appreciate. 
So it means the same thing, right? So just simply, it's harder to hear because now you have a layer of fluid covering the heart. So it's going to be a lot harder for your stethoscope to pick up the sound of the valves opening and closing of the heart. So that's how you get Beck's triad. And that goes along with having cardiac tamponade. Now, the second part is, for example, you have a 50-year-old male coming in with chest pain. The first thing you want to do is to get an EKG in terms of, uh, uh, of testing that you want to do for this patient. And so it's interesting because they describe it as the QRS complexes having varying amplitudes. So this is describing the phenomenon known as electrical alternans. And so essentially all that means is the electrical activity of the heart is alternating, just like the name implies, electrical alternans. And so why this happens is because when the heart beats, it gets closer to the EKG. And so you have this huge QRS wave and then it it relaxes. And so this flu, uh, large amount of fluid in between the uh, electrodes and the heart diminishes the electrode's ability to pick up those electrical uh, act, uh, it, it decreases the ability to pick up the electrical activity. Therefore, the amplitude is going to be very low of the of the um, QRS complex. And remember, the QRS complex is going to be the ventricle contracting. That's what it represents. And so that's why it's going to be large, small, large, right? And so that's all it's saying in this sentence, that the EKG shows QRS complexes of varying amplitudes. And so finally, to answer this question, it asks a procedure in what area would relieve this patient's condition? Well, the answer is a B, epicardium and per parietal pericardium. And for that, we just need to do a anat anatomical review. So if we did a slice of this heart, we'd see that the first layer that we go through is the fibrous pericardium. Then it's going to be the parietal pericardium. And then it's going to be the pericardial cavity, right? And so then we have the epicardium. So notice that the pericardial, pericardial cavity, where we have this fluid buildup, where, and remember, there's a small amount of fluid in there already, but cardiac tamponade occurs when there's a huge sudden increase in fluid. And so that's how we get the cardiac tamponade. And so epicardiums are here, we have the myocardium, endocardium, and then finally we get to the heart chamber. And so this is where the needle would go for the procedure, which is called a periocardiosynthesis. So the needle goes through these few layers, the fibrous and parietal, and then you, you want to hit the pericardial layer, which is in between, or pericardial cavity, which is in between the epicardium and the parietal um, pericardium. So when it hits this layer, you can with, withdraw the fluid, and now suddenly the heart is decompressed, and it can um, uh, it can start beating and contracting with its full force again, and ho hopefully start returning that blood flow so the blood pressure is optimized. So to answer this question, essentially you had to recognize that this was a cardiac tamponade, which they give you plenty of clues to do so, Remembering this triad is useful, uh, and you'll quickly see the JVD, which is right here, distension of jugular vein. You'll see the hypotension, and then finally the muffled heart sounds, which are right there. So in one sentence, it gives you Beck's triad, and then just to solidify this diagnosis, it gives you the EKG findings, which are, uh, which are associated with cardiac tamponade. And then finally, to answer this, you need a little bit of anatomical and awareness. And so you know that the pericardial cavity of the heart, which normally has a small amount of fluid, is located between the epicardium and the parietal pericardium. So I hope that was helpful and thank you for watching.